<laughs> and then in the meantime, we have Michael Blanker here with us tonight. And I'm kind of excited that he's here because my husband and I got involved with the First Light Battery when the Historical Society did a program at St. Peter's last October. And my husband portrayed Charles Bissell, who was buried at the St. Peter's Cemetery. And then we started reading the two-volume history of the First Light Battery. And then I found Michael's um, form online, or his description of the, the cannon wheel that's up in the state capitol in the Hall of Flex. So that really brought it home. And when we realized that 32 or 34 of the men from Hebron were participants in that unit, we figured we could try and grab Mike and, and have him come down as well. So I'm really happy that he's here. I'm happy that you're here. Mike, you want to take over here? So thank you for having me. Thank you for Mary Ellen and the Hebron Historical Society. Um, I'm going to talk tonight uh, about uh, the first light battery, which was a, a, a light cannon battery. Um, and I'm going to talk about three things, mostly about the first light battery, which was a statewide um, regiment from the Civil War uh, from Connecticut. Uh, but I'm going to talk a little bit about Hebron's role in the first light battery. And then at the end, um, talk a little bit about how um, Civil War memory can be complex. Um, people like events like this. Um, the Civil War has, has a big place, even now, in our identity. Um, but there's some, some complexities to the way we remember it that maybe it is. Um, so to begin with, I'm not an expert on the First Light Battery. Uh, I'm not an expert on the Civil War. Um, so uh, I, you know, please, uh, you don't have to save the questions for the end as we go through. If you have comments or criticisms or questions, please, please feel free and you know, we can discuss. Um, I came to the First Light Battery because uh, I'm finishing up some graduate work at CCSU, and I took a course um, with Professor Matthew Warshower, who is an expert on the Civil War, if you could get him to come here. Um, and he's particularly an expert on the Civil War in Connecticut. He's written a book called The Connecticut and American Civil War. And um, he had a graduate class that I took, and he assigned each of the students to do research on one of the uh, monuments related to the Civil War at the State House. Um, and so the one that I was given was the gun wheel from the First Light Battery. So um, what I learned, I learned from, from doing some research on that. Um, if you go to the State House it's a, it, and you're interested in the Civil War, the whole State House itself is really a monument to the Civil War. It was, it was completed after the Civil War. A lot of the statues on the outside are important figures from the Civil War. Um, and you know, there's a, they brought a tree back from one of the battles with a cannonball in it. Um, there's the Hall of Flags, which is really impressive, has um, regimental flags, including one from the 29th Connecticut, which is one of the first African American units of the Civil War in the country. Um, so if you're interested or if you just want to go to ConnecticutHistory.org, um, you, can, you can see the, the research that the students did um, for Professor Walsh. Um, so as I said, I started with the wheel. Um, the wheel was uh, damaged, I don't know if you can see here, but uh, was hit here and here during the Battle of Proctor's Creek in Virginia. Um, the Battle of Proctor's Creek was the big battle for this unit. Um, it's where people had their heroism, it's where they made their names, it's where unfortunately the most casualties for the unit were. Um, and uh, as we'll see a little later, the captain of the unit, um, A.P. Rocco, had the, um, the wheel sent north and uh, tried to give it to historical societies. And in the 1870s and 1880s, nobody wanted it, which you know, probably drives the people here crazy, but we had a shot that we would have grabbed it. Um, but it did eventually end up in the State House. Um, during the incident itself, uh, there were two men closest to where the cannon was hit. One was Willard Davis of Guilford, and the other was Curtis State of Sinsbury. Um, the, the comrades of the two thought uh, Davis was dead and that Bacon would be fine, but as often happened in the Civil War, um, Something like 85 to 90 percent of the people who died died from disease and gangrene. And Davis was fine, and Bacon died uh, about six months later from, from gangrene. Um, a lot of the information that I found is the, is the same uh, text that Mary Ellen referred to. Uh, uh, Herbert Beecher, who was a veteran of the unit, wrote a two volume history. Uh, and it's full of stories of history. Um, and, you know, he said the first Connecticut you know, Light Battery was composed of men who believed that liberty was a sacred thing. Um, and offer their lives um, on the altar of freedom. 
Um, before getting into the battery, I guess the one overall thing that struck me doing the research was um, how, how much uh, soldiers on both sides essentially volunteered to die. Um, it's really surprising when you realize how much of these units were volunteers and how many of these men, especially the men from Hebron, re-enlisted after their three years war. So their commitment to the war and war effort um, was impressive. Um, and you know, it's, it's always surprising to remember that this was you know, primarily a volunteer uh, war, that people volunteered to take these risks. Um, there's recently been some debate about the total number of dead. For, for a long time, this number is 618,212. It's kind of a catechism from about 1900 up until about the year 2010. Uh, but some people did some research using census data, and now the number of dead from wars is between 750 and 850,000. So uh, the more research that's being done, the, the toll that these, these soldiers were in was, was messy. Okay, so uh, a little bit about the battery. Um, it was organized in 1861. It started with 156 men. Uh, during the course of the war, a total of about 300 men um, moved in out of the regiment. Um, it was largely from New Haven and Guilford. Um, you'll see that when we get towards the end, if you see the reunions they had, they were always in New Haven and Guilford. Um, the New Haven and Guilford veterans kind of uh, dominated uh, the reunions. Um, in 1864, it was transferred to General Terry, who was, who was also from Hartford, and it was the first regiment to return to the state at the end of the war. Um, and uh, Terry is an interesting individual, because obviously he was, a, he was a great military leader, but he was also one of the people who really advocated for uh, the ex-slaves, the free people's rights after the war. Um, this is a letter that he wrote to President Grant talking about how the Union Army was not doing enough to protect um, the free people from the attacks of the Klan and the attacks of planters. Um, and you know, he was one of the people that really argued against the Union Army being pulled out of the South in 1876 when the Union troops finally went home because he argued that if we do that, um, Virtual slavery is going to return to the South. Um, he, he ultimately did not win the day, but he's, he's remembered as a really strong advocate um, of protecting um, African Americans and newly free people from um, for what was coming. Okay. So, what was the light battery? Um, you know, I'm not a military expert, so um, essentially there were there was heavy heavy um, batteries and light batteries. The first Connecticut was a light battery. Um, sometimes they were organized around horses, where the, the cannoneers would ride on horses. Uh, the first tank was a, a mountain where the men walked uh, with, with the cannon. Um, and the way that it was typically laid out is there was a cannon, and then there was a limber, which was used to hold up the back of the cannon when we moved it. And then attached to the limber was a caisson, and the caisson would have uh, the ammunition, um, usually around 1,200 rounds. Um, and you can see sort of the way it was organized. You had um, the four cannons here who were responsible um, for loading the gun, for maintaining the gun, for doing something called thumbing the vent. Apparently what happened is if, um, as you had a number of shots in a row, there would be residue left, which could be, uh, which could ignite uh, prematurely on the next shot. So a lot of times these men had to get very close just before it was shot to make sure that there was no debris from the previous shot, which would cause it to kind of explode in their faces. Um, you had another individual who carried the ammunition from uh, the cases of the gun. You had two people who prepared the ammunition fuses, and then you had the gunner. And the gunner was responsible for aiming it, controlling it. Um, he was in charge. Um, there are only two pictures of the unit that I could find, and unfortunately, this one is probably not the first light battery, even though it's labeled the first light battery. Um, what historians do, the way they make our living, I mean, I'm a teacher, but like, real historians, the way they make their living is to constantly reinterpret things that are supposedly established. So for many decades, everybody said this was the first light battery at the Battle of Fredericksburg. Um, and then some historian had the nerve of saying, well, the first light battery wasn't at Fredericksburg. So it's probably not the first light battery. But it is in the Library of Congress considered the first light battery. So um, it is a light battery, so you get the basic idea. Yeah. Um, this is a picture of the first light battery. This is from uh, Beecher's book at the uh, Battle of Bowden, Virginia. Um, it's posed, so it's, it's not during combat, which seems reasonable. And as far as I can find, this was the only actual picture um, available. Um, the unit fought in about 20 um, battles. Um, 
mostly in 63 and 64. Um, it's interesting, again, this idea of Civil War memory. Um, you know, wherever you go, there's always these placards um, in all these little towns across uh, the country um, remembering these battles. Often different names, so Southerners have different names for the, that threw me first. Uh, you know, it seemed like 20 battles, but sometimes 30 battles, just because a lot of times the Southerners use different names for the battles uh, than the Northerners. Um, there were two probably most prominent battles in, in the regiment's history. Um, the first was the Battle of Chester Station. Um, this was in Virginia in May of 64. Um, and essentially what happened is uh, General Butler's army tried to destroy a train depot to disrupt the distribution of um, Confederate troops and supplies. Um, and the Confederates, highly outnumbered, attacked Butler's army and drove him off, preserving the railroad station for the Confederates. Um, Butler generally had the reputation of being very cautious. Um, one of the problems that Lincoln had was he had no difficulty finding a general who was willing to do what was necessary because it would mean the death of thousands of soldiers. And a lot of his early generals were hesitant uh, because they know if you really fight this war, you're going to lose tens of thousands of men. And it really wasn't until Grant, who essentially was, was ready to sacrifice the number of men that were needed. Butler was very hesitant. So I'm sorry to say that he, he could have held um, if he hadn't retreated, but he argued that if he'd held, it would have been too high a cost of men. Um, essentially, for the, for the uh, first battery, um, Company A of the battery ran out of ammunition and looked like they were going to be captured. Um, but as we'll see in the AP Rockwell, the captain noticed that they were out of ammunition and quickly mobilized um, two other companies of the regiment and the 7th Connecticut Infantry, who were able to save. Um, the company from, you know, not only being captured, but, but losing their guns. Um, most historians consider it uh, inconclusive. Um, very different than the Battle of Proctor's Creek, which was really the main battle in the, um, in the unit's history. Uh, it happened just a few days later. So there's two or three battles before this and two or three battles after this. It's really in the middle of May of 64 that the battle, that the battle was the most engaged. This is the battle in which the gunman was damaged. Um, and again, it's, it's Confederates are highly outnumbered, 18,000 to 30,000 Union troops. Um, again, Butler is a little hesitant, according to historians, um, and the, the South wins. Uh, and some historians have argued that Butler had the chance to take Richmond, but his hesitancy and kind of the uh, chutzpah of the Southern soldiers um, prevented that. Um, there was a number of heavy exchanges. This is actually um, one of the battery uh, cannons. Uh, this is about a year after the battle was still in. Oh yeah, Drew's Bluff. Um, most historians consider it a Confederate victory. These are the, these are the two big battles. Um, casualties of, of the light battle. Um, you know what we're looking at here? Yeah. Gang, gang Green. Um, it's interesting to note that two men were killed in action, but 20 died from disease. And that's about roughly the, the kind of consistent um, ratio. That it was really disease, uh, it was really soldiers that got amputations and you know horrific conditions. The idea of germs uh, as, a, as a medical knowledge was just beginning to emerge. Um, bad luck, very bad luck for Henry Bullard, who was the first person in the unit to die, was from Guilford. Um, he died of typhoid on the way to the south, so the unit hadn't even engaged yet, and they already had a, a, a loss from disease. Um, they had two people die in, uh, in action, Henry Bullard. Uh, we say that the George Metcalf of Hartford, again, both at, at Proctor's Creeks, Proctor's Creek, uh, Curtis Bacon, you mentioned, Henry Bullard. Um, these are the men from the unit who died from disease during active service. Um, and again, it's, it's overwhelmingly disease, gangrene. Uh, I thought I'd put in some, you know, there's some gruesome pictures of uh, how, how hor horrific and how uh, gangrene could spread so quickly for these soldiers and, and very little they could do. Um, one interesting thing is, is during the war, um, only 13 members of the unit admitted or acknowledged they were wounded. But when I checked some of the post-war pension reports, there was another 16. Um, so that's not clear why why those soldiers didn't report their injuries while during the battle. Um, one historian speculated that they were wounded and only the severity of them only emerged over time. Um, and another suggested that you know maybe there was kind of a macho sentiment that they tried to suppress. Um, admitting the injury and then we later as they got into later life. Um, the big hero of the unit was Captain Alfred P. Rockwell, uh, who was born in Norwich. 
Um, he's the hero of both uh, Proctor's Creek and Chester Station, um, which again makes some historians um, question because Rockwell had such big, had so much um, credibility with the troops. When Beecher wrote the history, it's possible that um, because Rockwell was seen as so important, his focus in writing the history is on Proctor's Creek and Chester Station because of, of Rockwell's role. Um, his success led him out of the unit. He was promoted eventually to Brigadier General. Um, he became a professor of mining. He was the head of the Boston Fire Commission. Um, this is a, a drawing he did, uh, I think, in the 1890s um, of the Battle of Proctor's Creek. Apparently, explained to somebody how the troops were set up. And you can imagine a bunch of them sitting around in Boston and recollecting um, back to the, to the battle and drawing it out. So, stories. These are, what, these are really what are, what are interesting about the unit. Um, this is Edwin Sock Lashley of Guilford. Um, he was hit um, by a ball and uh, started, as he fell, to proclaim he was dying and start saying goodbye to people. He fell on the ground, a medic came over uh, and said, I got to look at his nose. If I take my hand off, the blood will come pouring out. And he's holding it to his chest. Finally, the medic convinces him um, to pull it away. And it's nothing. It was a stent ball that had lost its power. Uh, he vomited and returned to battle. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently, uh, for the rest of his life, he was all too ready to show off uh, the scar that he left and, and how he was done. The book is full of stories like that. Um, and Edward Grizzle uh, told a story about um, they had just come back from a battle and they saw a surgeon who was trying to amputate a soldier's arm in the battlefield, saying that there wasn't enough time. Um, the, the soldiers, uh, Grizzle and his comrades came up and they could smell alcohol on the doctor and realized that this, this probably isn't uh, the best thing. So they tried to take him away and the surgeon said, um, I'm higher rank than you, if you do that, you know, Court martial. Um, they assisted, I kind of, wouldn't say they hit the, the commander, but they, they physically removed him. They, they took the man um, to the medic tent. Um, I don't know what happened to the man, but I do know that they were never charged. So, mm -hmm. probably sensibly, the doctor sobered up and realized that it probably wasn't in his interest to, to raise the incident uh, in that he was drawn. Um, the book that Beecher wrote that a lot of this comes from uh, is the two volumes. Um, Beecher talked a lot about. Um, I think he was somewhat concerned that uh, because the, the unit was a, uh, a cannon battery, it wasn't an infantry unit. The, the, the impact of the war was not as devastating on this unit as it would have been on infantry units. Um, and a lot of the book is filled with stories and anecdotes. But he did, one thing he stressed is, is, is that he wanted people to understand that the real difficulty in being in a, um, a cannon battery was when you were watching your troops advance you were supposed to move with them to cover them. And it was very difficult to do, especially if the terrain was uneasy. And he talked about how often they felt they failed because they weren't able to keep the cannons up with the advancing infantry. Um, he would say things like, you know, recall the terrible slaughter. We see again the men filling up the ranks as their comrades were shot down. We look upon the ground soon with the dead dying. And he, he just felt there was kind of a difficulty in just being um, a cannoneer because it was so hard to to kind of cover your men, given, given the level of technology and the terrain. He did tell one interesting story, though, about um, they were trying to take a fort, and uh, there was a, they were trying to cover the 8th Michigan, and they got to the wall and realized they weren't going to take the fort, and somebody sounded the tree, and there was this guy from Michigan named Grand Rock, who was quite really tall, and he, as they were retreating, he reached into the wall and took out a Confederate soldier and just dragged him back with them. Um, <laughs> took him as well. At least we got this. Was kind of his. So there's there's a lot of a lot of interesting stories like that. Um, some other interesting stories that kind of tell you something about the unit. Um, if you've seen the movie uh, Glory, you know about Fort Wagner. Um, the first like battle was at that battle. They, they provided some um, cannon protection for the fifth fifty fourth Massachusetts. Um, and General Gilmore was so impressed that he wanted each company to get have three men get a medal. Um, Captain Rockwell thought that was a mistake. Everyone was, was equally heroic. Uh, General Gilmore insisted, so he came up with an idea, just do it by lottery. So since the whole unit was courageous, we'll just do it by lottery. 
um, and uh, J.F. Bliss won it, and apparently um, he had to be reminded on several occasions that he won it by lottery. Because apparently he was walking around like he was all that, and he talks about how some of his comments had to say, you know, take it easy, we all know how you got it. Um, something less uh, pleasant is um, in 1864, there was a private attorney for the 24th Massachusetts who deserted um, his unit um, and joined the Confederate Army and then deserted the Confederacy Army at the Battle of Deep Bottom, Virginia, and accidentally crossed the Union lines and was captured by, of course, his own unit, the 24th Massachusetts, um, which uh, the commander said they did not have to execute him, they wouldn't put them through that, but uh, they chose to execute him. Um, he, was, he was killed for desertion, and before his execution, he was imprisoned in the camp of the First Light Battery. So, you know, humor and, and tragedy are on the side by side. Kind of too. Yep. That was their view. There you go. That was their view. And that's a good point because remember, these again are volunteers. These are these are you know, these are not people who, who are gonna have a view that, well, you know, it's the army, it's this big thing, it's this is us. These are people from the same town. Um the it was a feeling of neutral, but that's a fair point. Um the unit had a complicated relationship um, with African Americans. Um, this is a picture of the 29th um, Connecticut Regiment, which was the first African American regiment that fought in the Civil War um, for Connecticut. Um, certainly, the soldiers were conscious that they were ending slavery. Beecher claimed that it was the number one achievement of the, of the soldiers, even more than saving the Union, was ending slavery. Um, a lot of the soldiers in his book tell stories about um, how heroic uh, African American soldiers were, how seeing them in action um, undercut the myths about them not being courageous. Um, and they also noted that they received particular brutality from Confederates. So when uh, white soldiers were captured and black soldiers were captured, the black soldiers were uh, brutalized much more extensively than the white soldiers. Um, Having said all this, the, the battery, and, and we see it a lot in Beecher's book, uh, express a lot of the same kind of stereotypes um, and paternalism um, that uh, the soldiers kind of talk about how these, these racist ideas are just Southern, but in fact, you see them coming from the Northern soldiers. Some of it is, you know, paternalism. Um, you know, there's an account of a couple of soldiers helping a, 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 a freed slave that joined up with the unit, writing love letters, and they're kind of treating him like he's stupid, and, one soldier ended up accidentally sleeping with another uh, with a, a freed slave, and it created a big crisis and all kinds of stereotyping. But there were a few more serious things. Um, at one point, the army decided that they needed fortifications at Hilton Head um, repaired, and they essentially forced um, these these runaway slaves into forced labor. And uh, Beecher kind of um, reveals. He says he was talking about how they were, he saw the the ex-slaves being chased through the camp by the army, and he called it a regular end hunt. And you know, that kind of word was, was very um, common, um, not just for Southern soldiers, but for Northern soldiers. So, um, ambiguous. I mean, clearly these men risked their lives, um, lost their lives sometimes to end slavery, but at the same time, um, in many ways, they, they carried and perpetuated some of the, the same racist ideas. So, uh, a complicated, a complicated relationship. Um, after the war, uh, the First Light set up a Veterans Association. Um, they began having annual unions in 1868. Of course, A.P. Rockwell was elected president. Um, this typical union in 89, they would, they would actually camp. So they would set up tents and you know, recreate the, the field of the good old days when they were young. Um, 42 veterans and 32 guests came to um, the reunion in 1899. Um, the main thing that the, the Veterans Association did was they, they raised money for a memorial. And it's in New Haven. Um, they were able to raise enough money along with the 7th and 10th infantries. Um, and that memorial is now in, um, in New Haven. This is a typical invitation to the first um, reunion. Um, and the uh, Veterans Association existed until 1904 when Rockwell died. The last record of it that I could find in the Hartford Current was in 1904 when they passed a resolution on remembering uh, Rockwell. After that, there's no record of the meeting, so maybe people were trying to get that off, and also maybe the death of Rockwell was kind of seen as, a, as an end point um, for the meeting. So that's the first light battery. Any, any questions about it? We'll move on to Hebrew, but any questions? Yes. Okay, you must explain the 
gangrene. Gangrene. It's basically an infection. So it's uh, a lot of times um, when they, when soldiers were shot, um, there was nothing. There was no antibiotics, so they would cut off arms and legs, and in doing that, it would open it to um, infection. In fact, uh, you know, you never see the doctor shows now. The doctors are always washing up between patients. Uh, in the Civil War, in part because of uh, the pressure to work quickly, but also because people did not did not yet have a sense of germs and how they could be spread. So people would, you know, amputate one arm and then go to the next and go to the next and not clean anything. And so gangrene and disease was, and there were no antibiotics to fight it when you got it. So it's so yeah, it's like bacteria. It's like ninety percent or eighty-eight percent of the people who died died from it. How many light batteries did Connecticut feel? Uh, I think it was three. It was three. But I'm not sure. I know there were two, because I know there was another one out of Hartford. And I think there was a third one out of um, the southwest of the state. I'm not sure what it is. Where was that monument you just showed in advance? Uh, it's it's uh, the tall one. The one in New Haven? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, it's, it's <coughs> truth be told, I don't know. I mean, I know Haven. I'm not sure exactly oh, where it is. You just go back there. Yeah. I'm not sure exactly where that is. Now, it looks so, like the Yale Chapel. Yeah, that's good. Is that what it looks like? Okay, so um, Hebrew. Um, one more question. Oh, of course. One of the first ones you showed said compensation. Um, I couldn't read what it then. Um, Way back at the beginning. Yeah, yeah. What was it? Compensation. If you volunteered, what your, what your pay could be, or oh, your okay. bonus pay could be. Um, I probably can't. <laughs> I think it was thirty dollars a year. But Miriam said she saw that they had a three hundred dollar bonus if they signed up. They had a bounty on enlistment, and they got up to three hundred dollars to enlist. And I think that one says it was thirty dollars a year. And then there's a certain amount for each child and each wife. Well, you know, also, too, that uh, uh, the wounded veterans uh, who were injured also received a pension. And I think it extended to, uh, to their uh, spouses after, after the passing. Because I know that was discussed when I portrayed uh, Charles, uh, Charles Bissell, who was, was wounded. I probably lost his arm. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. And, you know, you refer to them as men. But was there an average age? And I know a lot were so many. I can show you. I have so young, like 18 or 17. I have a, Connecticut put out a, a book in 1862 of all the people that volunteered. And they put out another book in 1864, I think. Mm -hmm. And I have an image, at least for Hebert, I can show you. Because oh, okay. um, they, they break down by uh, whether they're single, their age, their job. Okay. Seems to work better passes. <laughs> okay. So, um, Hebron had about, now this, this already shows you how history works, because I, I found 30 men from Hebron, and Mary Ellen has found four more. So I think she's, she's made the history better. Um, I based mine on this, on uh, um, Beecher's book, and on this uh, catalog of Connecticut volunteers from 1861. But I think you looked at the census from 1960. I went into some of the people who are listed in certain towns. Um, Sheldon Porter, for one, said he was listed in Andover, but I found him in Hebron. Okay. And um, George Goodale was listed in Hebron, but all of his biography is from Farmington. Okay. So there's, there's a couple of errors in there, but I think that it's amazing that we have so many records right. that we can actually go back to. Yeah. In the middle of war, they were still keeping track of everything. Um, I think I can show you. Let me make this a little bigger. So, um, it's easier to get out here. But if you look, what I did is I put a little green, um, green. So you've got George Bliss, who was a master sergeant. He was from Hebrew, he was 30. 
He was single, he was a mechanic. You've got John Bliss, uh, he was married, he was a mechanic. Uh, what is he the age? Looks like he's in his uh, 30s, I think. No, 43. Um, 31, 49, we were asking about the ages. Um, 19, um, John Shaw. And unfortunately, the, the call, maybe if, if you're interested at the end, I can show you on my computer and you can look a little more precisely. Um, but uh, the, I think the thing that surprises me, uh, first of all, um, almost all the Hebrew men were early volunteers and almost all of them re-enlisted. There were very few drafted recruits in the unit for Hebrew. Um, and as we'll see in a minute, Hebrew kind of has this history of, you'll see that a lot of the men's fathers, you know, grandfathers fought in the War of 1812, and grandfathers fought in the Revolution. Um, so the fact that they volunteered, the fact that they re-enlisted after their three years, uh, there were young men, but in some ways it's, it's equally impressive there were older men who decided to fight. Um, you know, it's funny, it's sometimes hard for us to appreciate the Civil War. It was a very different time. Um, when you read soldiers' letters, you know, they wept. They read letters about how we wept, how we slept with each other at night, um, you know, out of just mourning and, um, you know, it was, it was a very different ideas of manhood, very different ideas about what was appropriate between men, um, that in modern times people might interpret that sexually, but it, it wasn't. Um, it was just the kind of idea that the bonds that these comrades had. Um, which is which is pretty striking. Um, there's also a second list. These are the recruits. So these are people that joined the unit after the initial call up in '61. Um, a few of them were volunteers, but most of them were um, were recruits. And uh, I also this was at the Connecticut Historical Society, which has a lot of interesting things. Um, there was a, a commemorative pin that the First Light Battery put out in one of their reunions in the 1870s, but they don't have a copy of that. But they do have one from the Second Light Battery. So this, you know, this was the kind of commemorative pin that um, units would typically put out in their reunions um, in the years after. Um, there are a lot of great stories from, from Hebron. Um, so first Lieutenant George Bliss. Um, who, did, who did you play? Uh, Charles Bissell. Charles Bissell. Okay. Yeah. Uh, first Lieutenant George was the quartermaster, which means he was responsible for the tents, the ammunition. He was in charge of the supplies of the unit. Uh, his great grandfather had been in the Revolution. Uh, Corporal George Barber, um, who volunteered in August '62, so he did not join um, initially, but he did volunteer. He was not a recruit. He was promoted to corporal. Uh, there were two brothers: Corporal Warren Bissell and Private Charles Bissell. Um, Warren Bissell had an interesting um, argument. They, one of the other units, the commanders pulled the some of the first light battery men away to unload a ship and work them for about 16 hours without feeding them and the men refused to work. And the commander came over ready to court-martial them, and apparently Bissell made this incredible speech to the commander saying if he just fed them, they would work another 16 hours and pleaded with the general uh, and convinced him. And apparently he, some of the uh, observations, he walked the line of criticizing the unit for overworking them, but then he would back off and flatter the general, and then he would criticize them and back off and flatter the general. And uh, apparently it worked, and, and the, <coughs> the unit was, was very glad. His, 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 uh, his brother Charles, uh, the right, lost an arm at Proctor's Creek. Um, he was one of the wounded. Um, Corporal John Bliss. Um, another interesting incident uh, the, the battery was just on off duty, hanging out with their guns in a, uh, a river um, in Virginia, and a um, Union ship landed around on a sandbar, and a bunch of Confederate ships found out and came to attack it. So they actually organized the batteries as close to the shore um, and defended the ship um, that didn't have guns with cannons from the shore uh, long enough up until the Union Navy could come in and, and rescue the ship. And you know, that was completely on his own, his own initiative. Um, Private William Brown, one of the most interesting figures, uh, he just says he was a victim of a near deadly practical joke. And of course, he never tells us what the practical joke was. Uh, my guess is, is that when he wrote the book, there were still people alive who might have gotten trouble <laughs> if he revealed what the practical joke was, so he didn't reveal the joke, but it's, it's, uh, it's very tantalizing. Um, Corporal Charles Warren, very interesting. He was honorably discharged for health, but re-enlisted. Um, and again, it's just one of the examples of how, um, and you know, I'm not arguing that this is um, limited to Hebrew, but I, I just focused on Hebrew, so 
clearly you're seeing men that um, were committed to the cause, to their comrades, um, and you know, someone who could have got out for health reasons had fought, certainly could have come back to Hebron and not been, not been called out, not have had his courage questioned. Nonetheless, he, he re-enlisted um, Corporal George Gillette, um, often filled in as an active sergeant. Um, Private Andrew Hanks was interesting because um, he and one of his brothers served, but two um, got substitutes. Um, I'm sure there's no substitutes. If you had enough money, you could pay somebody to go for you. Um, and apparently, uh, this caused a real conflict within the family that um, two brothers fought and two brothers um, you know, found their way out financially. And uh, Beecher kind of implies that Hanks didn't like to talk about it, but there was some, um, some clarity that there was some animosity. Animosity is too strong, some tension. And Harvey Johnson was an artificer, and this was obviously if it's a cannon unit, you need mechanics, you need metal workers, you need woodworkers. Um, and he was he was from Hebrew, but he was representative of um, the kind of skilled labor you needed to maintain these these cannons and, and working on them. Um, some other stories. Um, Corporal Alfred Leonard is also injured at the Battle of Proctor's Creek. So you can see that for this unit, Proctor's Creek was the you know, that was the decisive battle. Uh, Private John Lewis had an interesting, uh, soldiers would get bored and one of them said, you know, there's a tree down the ways with a big beehive with a lot of honey. Um, let's go get it. So they go get the honey and Loomis gets up the tree and is ready to take it and a possum jumps out of him. He falls, totally embarrassed. Everyone's laughing at him. They go back to the unit and attack insult to injury the unit has left. And they're now in danger of being deserters. Um, they forced an area to catch up with the unit um, before, at least officially before anybody noticed. Um, but he was razzed about the possum for the rest of his life. Uh, how the possum got the better of him. Um, <laughs> recruit Edwin Loveland, uh, interesting. Uh, he joined in 1864, which is comparatively late. And Beecher makes a point that his patriotism was never doubted. Um, but it made me wonder if he said that, if maybe his patriotism was doubted. So Beecher insisted that it wasn't. Um, so the fact that he would raise it, I, I it just raised the question, if, if you have a unit that's mostly volunteers that have been there for three, four years, and people join the war late, um, you know, how much were they accepted, how much was there, you know, where have you been? Um, and Beecher touches on that. Um, Private Alfred Minor was among the first troops to enter the Confederate capital. Um, he, was in, he was in the first unit. Um, another little unfortunate thing, Private Samuel Stevens had a daring escape from the Confederates, but the Beecher doesn't. Um, explain exactly what happened. Um, my sense is, is that um, sometimes you know, these are soldiers and they're looking out for each other. So again, I'm just speculating here, but maybe Stevens was not where he was supposed to be when he was captured. So to reveal the story might reveal that he was AWOL or he was not where he was supposed to be. Um, so I wonder, again, this is just me guessing. I don't, I don't know this from research, but perhaps, you know, uh, you know what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas, but it happens in, in, in the United States in the United States. Uh, Another interesting case, Alonzo Taylor, he was a musician. Um, he had the bugle. He was never going to see battle. Uh, he gave up the battle and joined, joined the fighting. Um, and I think, you know, there's, there's a lot of either pressure of ideas or pressure of comradeliness, but, um, you know, for someone to, again, have kind of a job that's completely honorable, um, and to choose to give it up because they, they want to be um, in combat. Um, again, just kind of shows um, the commitment of these soldiers. Uh, Private James Thompson and Francis Thompson, his son. Um, uh, James Thompson's great grandfather served in the Revolution, and uncle was in the War of 1812. So, again, you have this history of, of service from the men of Hebron. Um, uh, Francis Thompson, his son, again, is one of those examples of people who could have got out in 63. Uh, Early 64 and chose uh, to re enlist. Um, and most of the men did that. And you know, it's, uh, I wonder too if part of it is you know, now, if you look at the US Army, people, people in the unit come from all over the country. Uh, at this time, people came from the same town. So I'm sure that must have acted as partly a pressure because you had to go back to the town and, and live with people. And, and um, maybe in a positive way, it was a pressure, but it's possible that that could have been a pressure. Um, Private uh, Warren Waldo was honorably discharged by Lincoln's Order 86, um, and uh, I've been able to find Lincoln's Order 86, but it doesn't seem like it has anything to do with discharging someone, so I don't know, I have not been able to find what Lincoln's Order 86 was, 
Um, Waldo also had a similar incident to Loomis, except his involved a hog, and uh, he, he went and, and him and some of his comrades were able to steal a hog that they were able to butcher and eat. Uh, apparently they had to pay off only one officer before they were able to eat it. But interestingly, when Waldo talked about us, there was a lot of horses there too. And apparently for the next week, a lot of the soldiers were, were going to this farm to try to get animals, and a lot of them got in trouble. There were no court marshals, but uh, apparently um, Waldo had wet, wet, wetted people's appetite for what was on this farm, um, and got some of them in trouble. Obviously less pleasant, uh, there, were, there were some men who died um, from Hebron. Uh, Private Nathan Gillette, who was the standard bearer, um, died in both in South Carolina on August 4th. 1962. Um, James Taylor, who unfortunately I wasn't able to find a picture of, um, he died also in Norfolk, South Carolina. Um, he was an artificer, 23 years old, so younger. Um, artificer. I'm sorry? Artificer, artificer is, is someone who's a skilled laborer. So they're the ones who maintain the, the cannons, either the metalwork, the woodwork, the cleaning of them. He's the one who carries the, the unit flag. The, the, the bearer of the standard of the unit. Um, I think this is how, uh, Marianne, this is how you found me. Because you came across Lucy Jagger's. Uh, no, I found you with the cannon, cannon wheel at the um, State Capitol. Oh, I thought because this mentioned, this is in that article, and it mentions Hebrew, because he, he was from Hebrew. Um, the uh, Connecticut Historical Society has a bunch of these volunteer enlistment forms, and they're really interesting because, again, it's reinforcing that, this idea that these men enlisted. Um, and what's, what's really tragically ironic is uh, Lucy Jack, only, only uh, two men, four men, died in combat. Lucy Jagger was one of them. And the person who recruited him, George Metcalf, was one of the others. So you can see Lucy Jagger's signature is here, Metcalf's signature is here. Um, Metcalf was um, also an interesting, he was from Hartford. Um, during the Civil War, people elected their officers. So again, a very different kind of army. So much more democratic army. Um, Metcalf was, was voted into the officer position by his men. He was beloved. Uh, when he died, it was, it was really devastating for, for the unit. Um, but again, it's just kind of ironic that both the people um, you know, on the forum died. Uh, Lucius Jagger for Hebron and, and Metcalf the person that burned OK, so I have one more thing to talk about. But are there any questions before we move on? The last piece about Hebrew. I'm just wondering if you or someone else here knows what the population was in Hebron at that time, because I was trying to figure out, or if I knew that about the percentage of yes. men volunteered. Um, I don't know, does it even? Well, I think it's also a fact, too, that Hebron was also a larger mm -hmm. town at that point, too. Then it's larger now. than it was. Am I correct to that, Marino? I mean, it, it included part of Marvel and part of Andrew? No, not at that point. Not at that, that point, no. They had already it was smaller by then. It was? Okay. Oh. I stand corrected. Thank you. <laughs> 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 anyone know how? I think it's impressive. I mean, this isn't the only unit that Hebrew men went into, so there's other units. I don't know about those uh -huh. other units. I noticed the picture I showed at the beginning that showed the men who died from Hebrew in the Civil War. I think there was eight of them, or ten of them. Mm -hmm. So I think three are from, so there'd be seven men. So there were other units that, that Hebrew men went into. I just, I don't know. Um, I got one. Yeah, of course. Um, maybe Marianne can help with this too, but um, I don't know if they considered um, Sumner Hollow at that time, which was Gay City State Park, was that considered part of Hebron? Because I well, believe- part of, part of Gay City is in Bolton and parts mm -hmm. of Hebron. Because they had so. quite a few in the Civil War, I believe at, at that time from Sumner Hollow. I remember reading about it um, when the mills, back in the time when the mills were declining, that was one of the reasons they went off and fought in the Civil yeah. War. Yeah. Matter of fact, it was a factory that made belt buckles and buttons. So for the soldiers. Really? And is that part of Hebrew? Well, the same as back then. Back then, okay. It's part of both and Hebrew. But it's first trip. Um, so just the last thing I want to talk about is kind of um, how we remember this. Um, I mean, events like this um, are popular. So that was me because of the subject. The Civil War kind of remains. Um, you know, a real part of our identity. 
Um, and there's an interesting book by David Blake who teaches at Yale called Race and Reunion, The Civil War in American Memory. And he, he raises some interesting ideas. He says there were really three versions of how to remember the Civil War. And that's, obviously that's how historians think. They think about events and then they think about, almost as a separate thing, the way we make history about it. And you know, there's a common idea among historians that history really isn't about the past, it's really about the present. That you write history through your own perspectives, biases, interests. Um, and what Blay argues is there were kind of three ways that people remember the Civil War. The first, um, he calls the reconciliations. And this was that people on both sides had sacrificed, people on both sides were heroes. Um, let's remember the dead and let's reconcile, let's heal over the fact that at the time we thought each other was wrong, but we're all Americans, Southerners and Northerners are Americans, and, and let's heal. Um, a second version he talks about is what he calls the white supremacist view. The idea that, um, the, this idea of the lost cause, that the Southern cause was defeated, but it was right, um, and that it should remain, that the South should hold on to um, the memory of the Civil War, the ideas of the Civil War, and not, not um, not lose in the country's memory what they lost on the battlefield. We shouldn't accept the story to be told that the North was right, they were freeing slaves. Um, and then uh, Blake says there's a third memory, which was what he called the emancipationist view. The view that the war was fought not only to end slavery, but to integrate um, the ex-slaves into American society as equals. And what he argues is that what happened in America is there was a merger of the reconciliationist view and the white supremacist view. Um, and what it meant was most, and if you've ever seen Ken Burns' documentary mm -hmm. on the Civil War, he says it's kind of the conclusion that Ken Burns draws, is that this was a horrible thing uh, that divided the country, but um, we're, all, we're all reunited. We're all, we all, we're all great heroes. We're all fighting for our ideas of equality and of freedom. Um, and what Blight argues is the problem with that memory is it's a way for us to leave out what he claims the war was really about, which was the ending of slavery and the issue of equal rights for African Americans. And he argues more that in a society that was segregationist, um, so in the South and parts of the North, you had segregation for many generations, um, the country kind of agreed to forget about that part of the Civil War, to forget about that issue, to forget about um, equality and, and the 14th Amendment and rights for African Americans. And so we kind of created this memory that focused on the, the shared heroism um, as a way to make the better, you know. Um, that's fine, I, I was going to And as a way to uh, remember um, the war. Uh, there are people who disagree with him. There's a number of Southern historians who say that Blade is wrong because he overestimates the reconciliation. The South never, never reconciliated with the North. Um, the South has never healed over it. There were too many people dead. Southern soldiers and Northern soldiers could never um, see each other as comrades because they had lost too many friends, too many brothers, too many husbands. Um, and they just, you know, they say Burns' documentary is not really the way most people feel about the war, at least not the way people um, in the South feel. Um, and, you know, it raises just kind of a, um, a final question, which is, you know, what really was the Civil War? Was the Civil War, um, you know, and one of the slides that I don't have there is I was able to find a quote from a Northern soldier and a Southern soldier. And the Northern soldier said, you know, well, I'm proud to fight this war because we're fighting for liberty and freedom and we're fighting against tyranny. And then I have a quote from a Southern soldier in which he says, exactly the same thing. We're fighting for liberty against the tyranny of the North. Um, he's using the same language, he's using the same images. Um, and, you know, interestingly, if you look at Blight, he who, who wrote uh, that the Civil War, we really should remember that it's about the struggle for equality, well, he was a civil rights activist. And the historians who disagreed with him, uh, Jeff Neff is the, the head of the uh, Georgia State Confederacy Commemoration Committee, and Allison Jamie is an expert on the lost cause. So part of the problem with remembering an event as, as contentious and divisive as the Civil War, as we tend to remember it through our own interests, our own concerns. So, you know, uh, the whole thing with civil rights and segregation, that's such a mess. Let's remember it as a family squabble, 
you know, that's mostly healed. Or, you know, the North conquered us. So let's never forget that they treat us like they treat Bolivia. We're a conquered country, and we're not going to accept that, and we're going to keep it alive. And then you have people you know, like Frederick Douglass and other uh, scholars who say, you know, uh, the country blew it. The country had a chance to end not just slavery, but to end racism, and, and it didn't, and no one wanted to be reminded about that, so we forgot it. So um, I don't have an answer. I mean, everybody, I guess, has their own answer. But I think the final thing to say about the Civil War memory is um, we were Maybe we remember it less on the past and more what we think and are concerned about in the present. So, yes? So, uh, if you go back, if you want to get a better handle, I'm not saying what you're sure that is not complete. Oh, listen, it's not complete, so go get a better handle. Yeah, so we take it only back to the founding fathers and uh, the three fifths of the rest of the field. Okay. Um, if they didn't agree to that, premise that slaves would be considered three-fifths of a person so that the that South would have more representation in the Senate Congress. Um, that's really the issue that lived from that time all the way up to the Civil War. The Civil War was inevitable. Mm -hmm. It was inevitable because the issue was never set three-fifths of a person. And they were not willing to give up that premise, make them free. They are, you know, 100% a human. Pay them, and grow your industry from there. But it was all about their cotton's camp. Sure. Yeah, and I think you're right. And, 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 and you know, I think, and I hope in your teaching. Mm -hmm. that, High school level that this is what for you know and, and ask the kids to say you know make this blew this into your head you know it's um, it's probably the most important factor for the civil war I mean as far as I phone teaching myself yeah no I think you're right I mean I think part of the problem is the one part of history that is maybe the most important is that we don't teach and that's Reconstruction generally Americans stay away from Reconstruction uh, because it's exactly the Civil War is a victory, and the Civil Rights Movement is a victory, but Reconstruction is the problem. And um, it's interesting what you say, because there's some historians who call the Civil War the Second American Revolution, in that the Founding Fathers, for whatever reason, didn't really do the, didn't finish the job. They made a political revolution, they didn't make the social revolution, and so by waiting 80 years to do it, it became 10 times more bloody to finally do it. Um, but the period of Reconstruction is a really interesting period, because um, even different than the Civil Rights Movement, the, the Reconstruction period put land on the agenda. Yeah, the radical Republicans, um, if you see the, uh, there's the movie made about uh, the 13th Amendment with Daniel Day Lewis as Lincoln. Um, uh, it's, like, it's called Lincoln, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, and it kind of, again, it's, 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 an, uh, it's what, this is just my opinion, so please feel free to disagree. But it's, it's what we Americans like to do is we tell the happy part of the story which was the passing of the 13th Amendment, but then we don't want to look at the troubles of the 14th Amendment and how um, the radical Republicans were arguing, if you want equality, you have to give the ex-slaves land. You've got to make them a middle class because if you don't, if you keep the planter system in place, then those ex-slaves are going to end up in some form of, of, maybe not slavery, but some form of very restricted labor. And the argument was that's why you have to give them land for 40 acres of a mule, because then you'll create a middle class and you'll, you'll kill not just slavery, but racism um, for a whole series of reasons that you know, we don't have time to get into. But the North chose to abandon that project and um, we've struggled with segregation, you know, real segregation for many generations, and some people would say now de facto segregation. Um, but it's affected our memory. It's yeah. because, you know, nobody wants to deal in the middle of segregation, wants to deal with the emancipation. And we do, I think, I hope anyways, we do a better job um, with, uh, with you know, teaching social history, history from different points of view. Although I will say, even at the college level, you know, they, American history is divided, you know, from the beginning to 1877, 
and then the second one starts at 1877, and you know, in high school, you never get to the last chapter. So ultimately, you never teach reconstruction. And by the time you get to your next year, the teacher's like, well, we don't, we don't have to start with reconstruction, we can start after reconstruction. So it's probably the one thing kids don't learn, and I, I think part of the reason is because it's so politically uncomfortable for us to deal with I was with just going to ask you, if, as a teacher, how much reality can you teach these kids without being censored? Uh, I, mean, we're, you know yeah, yeah, I do, but no, we're, we're pretty... You can't really get into detail without offending somebody, maybe. Yeah, but there's there's been a bit of a change on that. I think we're... we're um, uh, I know when I taught U.S. history and the people I taught, we did teach Reconstruction. And I, uh, you know, the focus now is so much on, on engaging students mm -hmm. that I think it means uh, the view is more whatever you can do to engage them. So if you have, you know, Latinos or African Americans, then teach them their history because it'll engage them more. Yeah. It'll improve their skills. Uh, so I think um, I think it's more just. Um, I think it's important they see the reality of it, not mm -hmm. just the glossy. Yeah. No, yeah. I, I agree with you. You know, it's, it's harsh, but it's, it's the truth. The truth. Yeah. Although you know, that's touchy because you know I have to sometimes catch myself because I have my biases and I have my you know I teach history that reveals what I think is important um, mm -hmm. and that's you know I have to be upfront about that that we all right. do that and that can be distorting too because there could be someone who has a different view um, that mm -hmm. feels like well you know the questions you ask and the readings you give us reveal your bias um, that's what keeps hist historians in business because uh, you can always reinterpret even if you don't have new information you just reinterpret the old stuff. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. so, other questions? Yes, sir. This is probably like a really broad question, but how much uh, in the t teaching of history does the economics, you've got a culture that has basically kind of grows cotton and has a labor force that is cheaper than if they had to pay to do it, and then you've got an industrialized north that, you know, manufactures has factories, quote unquote, and uh, it's time to time goes, hey, we'll take some of the cotton you got down there and uh, use it ourselves. Does that become, I mean, because like in most wars, there's usually there's an Yeah, we, you know, uh, we, we do, you know, there's always changes, you know, when, when I was a kid, uh, it was a lot on uh, content, real specific content. Um, and then there was kind of a backlash against that, let's do big broad strokes, and let's focus on skills and themes. And I think now the move is to try to find a balance between the two. So, yes, to try to, um, you know, have some skills instruction and to try to, um, get the big themes of like, you know, migration, but also to get into some, of, a little more than maybe we were 10 years ago, into the content of, you know, what are the economic causes of this war, what are the economic results. Um, you know, when the North abandoned Reconstruction, you know, we, we talk about how, well, you had a whole country now that, that the North had conquered, the South was defeated, and the West was not going to be slave economy, it was going to be capitalist. You had all these immigrants coming from, you know, Europe who were going to go out west and rebuild capitalism and the American dream, and listen, let the South have home rule, because uh, that's not where the action is. So, from the capitalist point of view, um, you know, Reconstruction got boring and expensive and uninteresting, so they moved out that. So, um, you know, we do deal with that uh, to some extent. Good one. Mm -hmm. other, other questions? I was going to mention that too. You know, before the Civil War started, before Lincoln was elected, um, some historical books I read, things like that. The, the North and the South were already having problems, mm -hmm. and it was political and economic. So we mm -hmm. mentioned the economics of it. You know, just from what I could gather, it was those two things that started. The beginning of working towards the civil war, mm -hmm. and that was going on for maybe you know one or two presidents before Lincoln. There was things going on, so you know it's just economics. I think does have you know, maybe fifty percent reason for it starting. There's a uh, Eric Foner who's, who's kind of an expert on the reconstruction of the book called Free Men, Free Soil, Free Labor. And the idea was that for, um, my kids are always shocked when you ask them, you know, you say, who's the party that African Americans support now? They saw the Democrats. Yes, well, who was the party they supported in 1860? Mm -hmm. And they're shocked to know it was the Republicans. Um, and the kind of argument that, that Fonda advances is that um, for capitalism, slavery doesn't work. So you needed free labor, you needed factory labor. Um, and so the argument is that a lot of the motivation of the North to end slavery, there certainly were abolitionists and people who were intellectually opposed to slavery. 
But the reason that the, the, the Northern industrialists supported it is because they had a vision of America was going to now expand all the way to California, and it wasn't going to be slave labor, because that was the Southern elite's way of doing it. But the Northern capitalists in Boston and New York said, no, it's going to be free labor and factories, um, and um, it wasn't going to be slavery. So, you know, it's not to be cynical. It's not to say that, you know, the Republican Party was against slavery for moral reasons, but there was also at least equally big an economic factor in their opposition. No one makes the Civil War afraid to say that every civilization has had slavery issues. You know, and some countries <coughs> invaded others and they, they took captives. Some of them made enslaved, some of them killed them. Yeah. Um, and that's throughout history. It is. The thing is. about America is we fought against it and, and changed in such a young country, that's yeah. what I'm trying to say. Like, uh, we changed it so quickly. <laughs> it's amazing. You know, that's a fair point, although it's a little complicated because yeah. um, Thomas Jefferson, you know, is known for saying all men are created equal. He's also the first person to write that people of African descent were inferior. And there is, uh, it's, which is interesting, it surprises people sometimes. Uh, this is really exaggerated, so just excuse me, but just for the point, you could almost say that um, slavery before, uh, you know, Western slavery, the slave trade in the 1790s, was not racial. There really was not really an idea of races. Races are very, people, uh, sometimes surprised, races are very young. Uh, there were no white people before 1500. There were no black people before that. And that doesn't mean there weren't people with paler skin and darker skin, but people didn't identify by race, it's, that was really a creation of slavery. Because um, in the Roman Empire, if you had a slave, you didn't need to justify it. We're the Romans, you're weak, you owe the money, you're a slave. But if you're a democracy, you have a problem. How can you say all men are created equal and have slaves? Um, you create an idea to justify it. And unfortunately, Jefferson and some of the founding fathers were, were integral in that, in that creation of, well, if all men are created equal, either we've got to free the slaves, we've got to find a way to say, that they're, that they're not they're not fully human and it's 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 very young and it's it's kind of shocking how powerful and natural an idea it seems when it's only a few hundred years old. Exactly. The idea of racism. Mm -hmm. Three thousand years old plus. That premise. Go ahead, explain. Socrates. Go ahead. Socrates comes along and he sits down and begins to find it. Look at that book I just stepped on. Look at that horse I can train him. Look at that elephant I can contain him, I can move him. Nature's God has something special for human beings, different from all other living things. He came up with the premise, and you know what happened to him. Mm -hmm. He came up with the premise that man, created by God's, the, the, the nature's God, has the right to life, liberty, and ah, okay. so that is the moment he takes his first breath. Fast forward 3,000 years, and then sure. Jefferson writing. I did not know that. The Declaration of Independence, man's the right to life to pursue happiness. So he takes that premise, that's the ancient premise, right. and, and, and moves that forward. And I like to think that, and maybe, maybe I'm wrong, I don't know, but I, I like to think that, this, that the Civil War was all about that. And it, you know, when you look at history, you look at political, social, and economic view, viewpoint. And yes, yeah, slavery had the economic uh, factor in it, but there was more of a an indignation when what we wrote about white people and the happiness didn't, didn't concern black people. And I think that's ultimately, you know, what. Was a little bit of driving force. I understand the industry and okay. you know, the, the expansion of slavery in the North West. Uh, it's an idea. Sure. <laughs> mm -hmm. I've been caveman, it's nice. It's going to give you the book. You're going to ask me one of the questions. Thank you very much, folks. I really appreciate it.